Okay. So good afternoon. I'm the Vice Chancellor for Research and the Dean of the Graduate School at Montana Tech. And it's a pleasure to welcome you to the second public lecture of our Fall 2015 series. Um, before I introduce today's speaker, I want to let you all know that next week's speaker is Joan Broderick from Montana State University giving a talk in the Chemistry and Biology building on mechanisms of biological radical reactions. And that's at 4 p.m. on Thursday, and we hope those of you who are interested can make that. Today's speaker is Shanwei Wang from the Sun Yat-sen University in China, which is a university that Montana Tech is developing collaborations and partnerships with. Um, Shan Wei has been here for the last month uh, collaborating with Professor Xiaobi Zhu on research in the climate change and water resource area, uh, with the target being Central Asia, which is what he's in the track with. But he got his bachelor's degree in China, and I've already forgotten the university. Sichuan Normal University. Sichuan Normal University. Uh, and he got his PhD at the University of Texas, San Antonio, working then as a postdoc at the University of California, Irvine, before returning to China. His research areas include global change, the cryosphere and hydrology, and with remote sensing, uh, GIS, and hydrologic models. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Wong for a talk on the status and dominant causes of water resource changes in Central Asia, Tian Shan Mountains. Good afternoon. Thank you, Beverly, and thanks, Xiaobin to invite me to come here. So I, uh, today is a special day in China. It's actually yesterday. It's a Teacher's Day, the 19th. So wish every teacher had a happy day. <coughs> so I come from the Sun Yat-sen University. So before I start my talk, uh, I just uh, uh, use couple minutes to briefly introduce my university and uh, uh, our school. So this uh, Sun Yat-sen University, this university was uh, founded by the Dr. Sun Yat-sen, it's Cantonese, the pronunciation is Cantonese. So in 1954, and then they changed. <coughs> uh, Dr. Sun is a very great democratic revolution leader, also the modern, the father of the modern China. So this university, Sun Yat-sen University, is originally known as the Guangdong University in 1924 when the university was established by Dr. Sun. And then it was changed the name to Sun Yat-sen University in 1926 for memorizing the Dr. Sun. It was also called the Zhongshan University in Chinese. Okay. So this university is one of the top universities in China. And it currently, it has about 10,000 10, faculty and staff, and uh, more than 80,000 students on the four campus. So uh, it is located here in the south of China. So the here is Hong Kong, the laser point, and the work where the laser point. The Hong Kong, the Guangzhou, the Hong Kong, Macau, Shenzhen, Zhuhai. So we have four campus. The first one is the main campus, the south campus. And the second one is the, the north campus. It's a medical school and it was uh, separated in the 1950s. And they, they joined in the, uh, 2002 uh, to the Sun Yat-sen University. We also established a new campus in Tucson, uh, in the, back, the University of Town, the East Campus. And then we have also have uh, uh, another new campus at the same time as the East Campus. It was established in the, in the coast city in Zhuhai. That's a full campus. Okay, for the school of uh, our, the school of geography, it stepped from the Department of Geography. It was started, uh, established in 1929 by a professor from Germany. And then in the 
80s, you know, formed a school of earth science, uh, earth and environmental science. And uh, the 2002, this school split into four schools. A school of environmental science and engineering, school of tourism. And our school is a school of geography and planning. So how about last month, several professors, oh, several professors from School of Geology and Engineering visit here. So that's where we all, all come from the, the same uh, origin. So for our School of Geo Geography, so we have four departments at one gra uh, geographical experimental center. So these four, de four departments are as urban and regional planning is a larger department. Hello, we, I am in the remote center and the GS engineer. We also have two departments, land resource and the environmental science, and water resource and the environmental science. At the meantime, so the faculties also established like, the multidisciplinary institute, eight uh, institutes. But that's uh, uh, very briefly introduction about the uh, university. So let's come to the talk for today's talk. I study for the water resource with this uh, water, res water storage changes in the Central Asia, particularly on the Tesla Mountains. So that's my outline of this talk. First, I will introduce the study areas, and then the objectives. So what I was going to, to answer after I finish my studies. And what data and methodology I will use. And then I'll particularly briefly introduce the three aspects of the auto storage change. One is the total auto storage change by the grid satellite. A second one is to study the snow, the variations of the snow cover. I studied the snow cover in northern Xinjiang Park since 2004 in these areas. So also, also I recently need to work on the glaciers to see how fast has the glacier retreated in these areas. And then come to the, the summary. So that's the, the circle, the red circle is the Central Asia. You see, that's in the middle of this continent, Eurasia continent. The water is very limited. It's a dry land. It's arid and semi-arid regions. From the south, the water cannot go, very little water can pass through this, the typical plateaus, like seven or eight thousand meters. And uh, this is the third pole, is high plateaus. So this is the largest desert in Teknamagan desert in the world. The, the second largest desert. So the only available water, the moisture, only comes from the Arctic Ocean inside, from the, the northwest. So that's, look at the, the central Texas, this part. This, I'm mostly focused on these areas. So in the south, there are no very little water available to, to transport to here. So the water is only come from the west. So this, this is the Yili River Basin. That's the Yili River is the largest river in the stream flow. So the Tarim River is uh, the longest river. So that's uh, basically the four rivers, Tarim River, Yini River, Kaidu River, and this in turn to go to the Narin Rivers to Georgetown. So that we say this is the dry land areas, no water or less than 100 millimeters the annual precipitation. We can say there are a lot of vegetation lands. This is a farm land, agricultural land. All of the, this land needs the water supplies from the mountains. The rainfall, the snow melting, and the glacier melting. So the mountains, the rainfall is under rainfall from 500 to 800 millimeters. But on the, on, the, on the southern desert, it's less than 100 millimeters. It's definitely dry. So this is, I go to the field in 2013. Uh, in the July, we can say, can we turn off the lights here? Uh oh. I think, I think it's the one that's down in the, I think it's that. No, maybe it's the other one. Okay. 
Yes, it's better. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. So this is the, the, the July, July 3rd. I went to the top of the mountain from the northern Wunamuch to the southern the Tarim rivers. We need to, to go up to the, the top of the mountains. There's uh, lots of snow there. So the snow melting is a very important water resource for the downstream or for the local system or ecosystems. So for the glacier matching these glacier studies, I just focus on the central tier sets because this, that's the largest part of the glaciers. So these areas with an average of about 2,500 meters. So that's some pictures on the top of the mountains for the glacier and snow. So my study questions, so I started the, this rainfall, snow, and the glacier melting hydrology, and the interactions between the human, human activity and the environmental and the ecosystem. So that's the, the, the big question, the big pictures. But specifically, I, what I'm doing uh, is to try to understand what is the trend of the total water resource changes in these areas. And for uh, how fast have the glacier retreated in the past like uh, half, cent half centuries, the past 40 years or 50 years? Uh, how do the variation of snow and glacier in the mountain affect the water resources for the water, the lower part, versus the agriculture now, the local social eco economy development? And what are the, domin the dominant causes for the water storage changes in this area? And what is our coding adaptation strategies for the regional and local water storage changes? But you know, that's a very the key questions for my study. But these questions is very difficult, very challenging to answer. So now that big data is a very, very popular in, in, in the issues. And to answer these questions, we also need the big data, every data available. We Grasp, grab every data, what is available, try to, to get a, a bigger picture or like, accurate information for these areas. So we work on different types of satellite data, like a GRIS, is a gravity recovery and the climate experiment data. This data is uh, available since 2002, so over 10 years. And also the NASA, the longest record for the Earth's surface and MHR, the Moody's, and also work on the, the topographic data, like uh, the shuttle radar topographic missions, SRTM, as also a popular data, animation data for the global studies. And ISAT is a laser data, the topographic data. It's very, very useful to study these remote regions and we also collected all kinds of data from Chinese Ganesha inventories, like world Ganesha inventories, and all kinds of data, uh, plus the institutional measurements and the, the models, hydrological and the climatic models, simulation. Combine them together to see the big picture and try to find the best answer. So, I will talk about these three parts. One is the total water storage change and what are the causes to, for these changes. Second part is the snow cover variation. The third part is the glacial variations, the areas, the thickness and the masses. So first, let's look at the total water storage change in the, in the Central Asia. That's the big picture, the red areas, that's the, the, the basins in the Central Asia. So we can say the total water storage change have a decreased trend, the large interval annually variation, signal value uh, variation, and a decreased trend. This total mass is basically about is the, the total water storage change. Let's focus on the central Tianshan part. That's this circle area, it's a nominal resolution of the Greece data. So we we'll work on this to say that Mount Tessa Mountains are the, the neighboring lowland areas. That's the most important area for China at least. So we say the, the total water storage also has a decreasing trend. And then this two-sided trend 
has much more rainfall. It's a wet year. Later, I talk more talk about more this year. So that's the increase the total water mass mitigate those this wet year mitigate this decreasing trend, but overall that is decreasing. What causes these changes? We need to an uh, analyze the, the causes or the mechanics for these areas. Those areas, we can say these are primarily four rivers or four basins. These rivers are in land rivers. Okay. So that's close watershed. The water band flow reaches the ocean. It cannot reach the ocean. They disappear in the middle way of the, of the river. So they, when, you, when, when we calculate the water balance, okay, the incoming water is precipitation. It has rainfall, mostly. And the outcoming is only the vapor transpiration. We call it ET. No outflows go to the ocean. So that's very easy to calculate the water balance. Income with rainfall, they come from the atmosphere, they, they disappear in the atmosphere. So the only thing is, we want to see how much water is available, that's the total water storage changes. Where is storage? The storage, is, one is in the, in the glaciers, <coughs> in the lakes. For this part, mostly are natural variations, the evaporation does not have much and the annual variation. So yet human activity effect, effect is limited. So the most important part is the soil moisture at groundwater, this part. We say the annual precipitation is less than 100 millimeter in these areas, but the potential evaporation is more than 2,000 millimeter, even like 3,000 millimeter. There are huge, huge gap, right? If we don't have water, the eva really evaporation only like less than 100 meter because the only wet water available is is that much. But once we pump up the groundwater out to spread on these areas, or pump pump up this lake water to these land areas, so that disappear by evaporation very quickly. So to control, to study these areas, the water resources, so that's the most important part, is the evaporation. Or to management the, the groundwater. So I'll talk about more later on. So that's the big picture of these things. So that's the human activity to cost the total water storage change, that's the primary causes for this because the agricultural land, the expanding, we we'll say they expand. So that's the vegetation extend by modis product and MHRs. I said 1980s to 2000. So the, the vegetative season at the total areas are increasing. This increase that means if you have vegetation, they have enough water, right? They'll evaporate more water out to reduce the total water storage changes. So we say the summer rainfall and the snow glacier, snow glacier melt are the primary water resources. Here we uh, illustrate those processes. So that's the stream flow from Kaizu River in the in this. In this river, it's Kaito River. So that's the, that's the, 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 the downstream, that's the, the river to go from Funo to the Boston Lake, that lake. This is a huge stream Funo. This stream Funo will completely disappear later on. So the flow to this Boston Lake, when they flow to inside this lake, then they have built a pump, st pump stations for water supply to pump the water out to the downstream, the Kongche River, and then to pipe all of this water to, for the irrigation. 
The water pressure is very high in these areas, like the stream funnels. More than 60% of the stream funnel were piped to the land surface for irrigation, for the cotton lamp, for coins, everything. So we say the potential ET is 10 times that the real ET is. If we pump this water, we, we pipe this water to these land areas, it will disappear very quickly. If we pump this groundwater out, to irrigate <laughs> to the surface, they also disappear, right? Evaporate very fast. So that's this line shows the groundwater pumping in each year in the bottle in the Kaido River Basin. How much water? We can see how much water they, they, they pump each year, a huge water pumped out. So when they pump the waters out, they are this the groundwater, the surface water, they have no government have very good management or constraint to the surface water, particularly for the pumping systems from Boston Lake to the downstream. But there are very little monitoring about the groundwater. Like some individuals or private companies that they invest huge money to, to dig this, this well to pump much more water than it wants. For this, for this irrigation is a very waste lots of water. So they continue to this type of irrigation for such several years, and then when they cannot reach the, the groundwater levels or when they out of groundwater, they abandon this cotton land. In the like, wild land, the cultivated this land and then they, they for several years they just abandoned the land because there's no more groundwater available. They use too much water. So when they pump the more waters, when they abandon abandoned these waters, we can say the downstream, there's no water to the downstream, the ecosystem. And even for these areas, the trees, the third trees, they are very important though function to protect the local ecosystem, the root cannot reach the groundwater. So these trees are died, gradually died. Well, these were uh, desertifications. The downstream, there's no more water available. So the trees cannot, the roots cannot reach the groundwater. The water were died or desertifications. So that's basically the, the, the principles of the mechanics of the water storage changes. So the primary reason is, is the human activity irrigations and the global all means also make this worse. So we say the groundwater, we don't have too much information, the total waters. We need to work on this that part. But another part, the, the water storage change in the mountain, that's the most most important thing. So I work on the, the mountain. First, to look at the, the snows. What's the variations of the snow, the base spatial temporal variations? So for the snows, it's uh, unaccessible in the remote regions. The only way we can do is use the satellite images. But uh, to, to study the snow is not a, uh, an easy job because we only can use the optical satellite images. They always have a lot of cloud to block the, the sensors. You don't know what it is under the cloud. So we primarily work on the MODIS satellite, uh, MODIS snow cover product. They have, they have two product, two sensors, uh, two satellites, one is uh, the Tena in the morning, one is Aqua in the afternoon. They have this identical instrument of the MODIS instrument. They have two parallel snow cover products. So I developed an algorithm to combine this morning and afternoon together, try to, because this, the cloud most of the time are moving around, combine to two together, you can reduce the cloud blocking, get more clean views. And they use 
we generate a daily card free snow cover product. After that, we use this new snow cover product to, to study the, the variations of the snow. So here is an example of the, the snow cover, snow cover product. The green is the fourth corner of a cloud. You can say in the morning how much cloud it is. In the morning and afternoon. The white is the snow. This is January 1st of 2004. So after we combine them together, we can say we can reduce the clouds to get a more clear view on, on the land surface. And for these areas, we can continue combinations. If these cloud areas, we can use the, the, the day before to replace the, the clear sky, pixel to replace these things. And after two or three days combination replacement, we can generate a, a cloud-free images, snow cover images. Because in the winter time, everybody here you know the snow cover time disappears, doesn't melt so soon. So that's uh, our, our one paper is published and we talk about this algorithm and use a case study in the northeast of China. And right now we're working on the, the Xinjiang areas. <coughs> so use <coughs> this cloud free snow cover product. You can do lots of things. So the first thing is we can mapping for a year, we can mapping how much days in that area are snow covered? We call it snow covered days. And this picture, this image, is 30 years average. <coughs> we can say, like the white areas, the snow covered days is larger than, is more than 180 days. But in the desert, desert areas, is less than 30 days, or almost no, no snow covers. So that's the overall picture. So use the multi picture, multi snow cover product. We can get the detailed information about the snow cover variation in these areas. So then we can use, we can get the anomalies. Use in each year, we can use the snow cover days to subtract the, the mean values, get the anomalies. So this is 2007, 2008. Is then have the least snow covers during these 13 year, 14 years. And the red color is less than the mean. And this is like 60 days less than the mean. This pink color is 30 to 60 days less than the mean. The white, this is higher than the mean. The dark areas is normal, neutral. Okay. You can see these sun years, this is like the temperature for this same period is highest temperature. So the least snow covers almost associated with the highest temperature. So what's the kind of this is 2009 to 2010. This year is uh, much wet years as we said before, right? As we saw before. So these areas had uh, like uh, 60 days the higher or 30 days higher than mean values, right? Compared to the, the first image, we can say, the interannual variations are very huge for the snow cover. So these interannual variations also caused huge problem for the local communities. And this, we can say this is a precipitation in 2010. It's a very wet year. Like we see the total water storage change, the grids see much more mass, right? So that's Consistent from grades and from the modes, different instruments get the similar trends or signatures. So the least snow cover is associated with temperature, but the most snow cover is associated with precipitation. So we are trying to, to go details to try to match the glaciers, but the snow and glacier are very similar. It's difficult to say. So in, instead of to work on the, the entire regions, I'm going to focus on this central Tessa, this is the central Tessa areas, this is northern Xinjiang, this is Altai mountains. So I focus on these areas. So I separate, for example, focus on the top of the mountains, try to see the minimum snow covers in the summertime. That's 
in terms like the, the, the glaciers. So I focus on the west, central, east, and northern TSN areas, try to see the details with snow cover variation. So that's the top line is the central TSN. The minimum snow cover uh, as decreased trend. And this purple is the west, this green in, is north, is east. This is in the northern part, very limited uh, uh, snow cover in the in the summer. So the, in the central TSF, that's the decreased trends. So the third part, when we look at the minimum snow covers, that's all the, the, the moldy snow cover per log. It also represents the general patterns of where the glacier distributed. So I'll further, because the MODIS has 500 meter spatial resolution, that is pretty coarse. On this, you can see this top of the mountains that find the work well. So I look at, work on the, the glacier markings, use a, a, a finer spatial resolution images and NASA image at 30 meters. So the questions for the glacier studies, when I work on this part, uh, previously I mostly work on the snows, but we say for the water balance, snow and glacier are very important water resource for this. So I work, recently I work on the glacier in the central TSS. So the first question is, is how fast does this or have this glacier retreated? Okay, how accurate can we get this information? Of course, there are lots of many studies in these areas. Later on, you can see different studies has a big difference for these the numbers. To try to answer, to get the answer is not an easy job because you have to, for the big areas, not a, a single or individual glacier. For individual glacier, it's easy. But here is like more than 10,000 of glaciers in this area. So there are different margin methods, the color cover issues. You never get, can get the, the best time window because the snow cover, the summer snow, the satellite images, the optical, normally it's difficult to dis distinguish between snow and the glaciers. And then the top of the glacier are always covered by snow. So there are lots of challenges. First thing, look at the snow. How the summer snow in the central, central Texas. This is an example in the 2006 from June to October. Look at this in the August 19th or 10th. This is the minimum snow cover from Modis product. It's like 3,000 square kilometers. But you say just one week ago, it's 5,000 square kilometers. Uh, one week later, in the August 27th, it's 4,000 square kilometers. So how can you get a really a glacial areas for the bigger region? For one year and for many years, from 1970s to 2030s, it's very difficult to get a, a consistent number. So we can say, this is the distribution of the cloud cover. The white is cloud, the snow. This green is the uh, green color is uh, the fourth color of the cloud. Here I use the original the Moody snow cover product in order to avoid any misclassifications. So that's the August second. So August six, the snow covers increase. August twelve. Decrease 19th the the, the smallest right the least extent, and then 27th the increase dramatically. So the best windows normally is in the in the middle of October, at the August at the end of the August. But uh, there are large interannual variations. And if we go to this the September, we can see a huge increase with snow covers. That's like last week, there's uh, a hill here, right? So the similar things in the top of the mountain, there's snow the year through the top of the mountains. 
because the, in this area, the highest elevation is more than 7,000 meters. Most areas are above 5,000 meters, are very cold. So the glacier mountains in the central tier set, so I, I just focus on the central part at this stage. I, later on, I expect to, to this the big picture, the big areas, the central Asia. So this is the elevation above 2,500 2, meters. So we can say this, we need lots of satellite and NASA images. That's the image tiles, how much image tiles we need to cover the, the entire region. Because the NASA image, they only have the visit time and 16 days. So each year, actually, it's very difficult to get a cloud-free image. You need to use several years complete together to cover the entire region. So I used 1970 to 2013, these four tiles mosaic together to together accurate matching of the glaciers. But the different images on a different date, you want to get the kind of way. So I use I uh, develop a new objective oriented method. This is easy to use for carried out for large region for huge imaging analysis. This classification actually is very comparable to the NDSI, that's the algorithm of the Moody Snow Cover classifications. And also this, and this is the, the ratio ratios. That's the method normally used for the Chinese glacier inventory, they use this type, the band ratio for classification. So they are very uh, similar results. But we also compared to unsupervised classification or supervised classifications, all kind of, and then we use this object-oriented object classifications. So first, look, the, take a look about the special resolutions. We want to compare our classification with the, the Modi's snow cover per life. So the green, the green one, the green, the, the, the middle one is the both satellites, both images see the snow or the glaciers. The green ones they only see by the NASA image, and the purple ones only see by the Modi's image. Look at the difference. The NASA images get more details. And Moody has got more, more snow covers or more glaciers. Then 2006, we can see, 2006 they have much more glaciers by the NASA because the NASA is 13 meters special resolution. Moody is a 500 meters. So the 2013, 2013s there are lots of snows. We can see the, the difference is huge. So then we compare the results. Get a, so we, we don't use, in this figure, we don't use the 1970s. The 1970s image is not good. It's not the five. Not. So the, the red one, red nine, is what we, we retrieve from NASA images. OK, this red nine from 1960s. That's a uh, consistently decreased trend. This is a, from the MODIS images we recover. MODIS product, the standard product, is 500 meters, is much smaller than the NASA images. At the top ones, and this one is from the World Geo uh, Glacial Inventories, the much larger than us. And another street from two sides is uh, zero loop. <laughs> loop is global cover product on the glacier machines. And this is the zero loop space agency's product. So these products are much larger than our classifications based on the NASA image. Also, we can see this curve or this curve that are consistently <coughs> increased. That's because in 2013, there are much more, there are, uh, snow, the snow is more than the normal years. So they also get a larger values, larger values. But our, when we reduce, mitigate the snow cover effect, 
the zero glacier are decreased in the similar chain. So this is from the 90s. So we this is the Chinese glacial inventories compared to this. So we can see this consist this trend are very consistent. So the, for the if we calculate from 1970s that the glacial area, the central TSI is about 7,000 square kilometers for now, like less than 4,000 square kilometers are left. In other ways, it means that about half of the glacier are disappeared during the past 50 years. That's a very dramatic change. This number is much not, is larger than the other studies. So besides we see this area changes, we want to know the mass change, right? We talk about the total water storage change, how much volume disappeared or the mass disappeared. So we look at uh, turn to the ISAT. ISAT is a laser satellite to get the elevation of the of the Earth's surface. But this is one spot by one spot. So we use the ISAT data with the SRTM. Because ISAT data you have data every year in March and October. But SRT but this the re, the, the flight track is done not repeat uh, identically. So we cannot really to work on the use the only ISAT data to get the elevation change. So we one way or another way is we see the difference. We have SRTM that was retrieved in the favor of two showers by radar missions, radar topographic mission. So that had 90 meters, the ISAT at 17 meters, the spot resolution are pretty similar. So we use these two satellites, uh, these two animation data to subtract, use the, N, use the ISAT to subtract the SRTM. Since the SRTM doesn't change, the ISAT has, okay, will change each year. So if the elevation changes, the difference will change, right? If the, if the another surface doesn't change, so each year, this, the difference of the elevation of the both satellites doesn't have a trend with the time. So and for the off glaciers, the another surface, that difference, the ISAT minus the SRTM band has a trend with time. But on the glaciers, the red line, the thickness, the, the difference has a change of trends, right? That's caused, we assume this change, this trend is caused by the, the animation decrease of the glaciers. So this study is with, uh, has very consistent results with the other studies just published in Nature Geoscience from a research group in Germany. Okay, this, their, this group also used the glacier model to simulate the variations of the glacier since 1960s. So all of this, we have the satellite data, we have the grids, we have the satellite image modes or the NASA and even glacier models. So all of these data have give a very consistent signal. So let's go to come to the summary. So in this Central Asia, it's dry land areas. In the Central Asia and in the TSI areas, the total water storage changes, the total are decline, are reduced the total water resource. The primary due to agricultural irrigation at the global warming make it worse, much worse. The snow cover in this area have very large interannual variation. This interannual variation adds more pressure to the local agriculture or the farm or the local economies. The glacier from our studies from NASA imaging for the Central Asia is much smaller than other products from the world, uh, world glacier inventories and from the other global snow cover products. 
And since the 1970s, almost half of the glaciers are disappeared. Like 40, around 40 percent are disappeared. About 180 square kilometers per year. That's huge numbers. And we also see the the total water mass are decreased, the mass decreased, but uh, that number is not so accurate as the area changes. So the glacial groundwater is depleting in this, that reduce, reducing, but the total mass needs further investigations. That I come to here, I work with Xiaobing, we try to, to figure out for specific reason, basins, how much water are available on the mountain and in the, in the lower basins, okay. So we are not sure how sustainable it is to the current water demand if we to use so much water as, as current as now. Okay, thank you for your attention. Yes. <laughs> so that's, that's huge, it's really a huge area. Yes. But I was wondering if there were any ground truth um, information that uh, the, I think most of what you talked about is satellite or remote sensing data. Yes. Um, and I was wondering if you know if if any of this is corroborated by ground truth, um, calibrated by that with you know, people wandering around and actually validating, particularly the depth measurements in the water, equivalent measurements. Here, for the mountain for Galicia, so you actually have a very good stations called number one, the Wundmuch River, number one Galicia. Here, they have consistent uh, in situ measurements since the 1950s and more than 60 years, but this is just a small glacier here. And here we have another station here recently installed the in situ measurements. And for the, of course, we have lots of gauge, rainfall gauge stations and treatment from those in this area. But the groundwater is a very coarse data, but in this, not area, the private wells. We, when we went to the fields in 2013, the summer of 2013, we could talk with the, sun, the, the farmers. That this area, this is a very large area, the Kaido River, this is the Ghost Lake, this is a Kuo a large city in population in the, the southern Xinjiang. And this area, look at this irrigated land area. This is more than, more than 10,000 wells, private wells. But this data is not managed by the local government. They just pump the water out. They don't measure how much water is available. Even don't have good estimate about the total water, how much total water is available. So that needs further investigation. When this is very, very little people, <laughs> very few people live here, <coughs> just remote areas, gobies, deserts, something. Follow what Ben was saying. We, still, we, we do not have a integrated land water or form of water or sense of water or snow water equipment. But they have no integrated system. Right? But that, that's an area. Oh, uh, that's a good question. Pretty tricky. Because we have this, we have. We do have this instrument or measurement, but these are financed to different agencies. And the, for the rainforest, the most agencies is from the weather, the, the meteorological administrations, they have the most of the rainfall gauge. And the other agencies have the extreme flow data. And for the groundwater, the private companies have this data. The government do not. Well, in this aspect, you say, if, if, if they, are, they are not working here, compared with US, US, they have a good network, bond network, bond, 
this area probably. Yeah, there are some research institutes that install their own, own like system, like the Xinjiang Institute of uh, Ecology and Geography. I have very good, uh, very close the cooperation with them. I also get a fund from the institutes. They are a, a key laboratory for uh, OCS and updated OCS and ecology. This is the, the state key laboratory. So they have in, in store, recently, just recently installed some, some wells monitoring the groundwater level. But uh, another issue is they don't know, they don't measure the total aquifers, how deep of the aquifer, how much total water available in these regions. Because uh, the waters flow from the mountain to this basin. They finally, even they don't evaporate, they are the, the finally were storage in the aquifers. But we know we are more and more cotton land, or not abandoned cotton land. That abandoned cotton land, that means the water level, water table is pretty low, probably 100 meters below the surface. That cannot reach by the roots or by the, uh, by the normally farmers. Mind if I do a Mongolia as a case study comment? Okay, Mongolia is in that area. Because with like Mongolia, you know, like on the western part of the country, yes, you you had a small group of collection of lakes down there, and then in Mongolia, you have you know a large percentage of the population, you know, for centuries, you know, they lived in the yurts, and they had their horses, cattle. And um, they had, you know, five main domestic stock. Their 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 cash crop was, you know, during the the boom period of like, you know, the early 2000s, they were doing the cotton, which they were making a lot of money from. But then they were overgrazing the land in the southwest part of Mongolia, and then the lakes that they, you know, they were able to get the water from, they have basically, and through also through, you know, the normal water cycle, those lakes have diminished down to almost levels of 50% or even lower. And then through the um, overgrazing of the land through the southwest corner, um, then you also have these huge powerful winds that come through there, sometimes 80 miles an hour. That whole part of the country has been sandblasted. So that area is, and then of course you have the Gobi Desert to the southern part of the whole, mostly southern part of Mongolia. So as a result, this is where you get into, you know, the effect on human population, Ulaanbaatar, which is the capital, is now two million people. You have the, the central city area, which was planned during the 1920s with the Russian planned economy area. And then on the outskirts of, you know, for miles and miles, you have the, um, you have the yurt districts, which just go on for miles and miles. And so you have 50% of the population now living in the capital, which that leads to all the other human problems, which I won't even have time to get into. Their gross national product, not even using PP or, or purchasing power priority standards, you know, is only like five billion dollars. They only have foreign currency reserves of about a billion dollars, and then most of their population now that does still, you know, follow the traditional thing is moving to the northeast part of the country where they have, you know, what's left of their forests and the national forests and the water rivers up <coughs> there, and they're doing some plans, you know, um, communities up there trying to use the rivers and the, the, the types of soils that are, you know, natural to that area in conjunction. But as far as their livestock total, it's actually dropped because they're not able to, so their land is almost at maximum capacity for supporting their five main livestock breeds. But you still continue to have the young generations moving into the Ulaanbaatar and the other large cities and you know, creating, so you're creating, you know, huge amounts of unemployment with a lot of the younger generations because they simply just don't have, you know, the industrial base, you know, to create a lot of jobs. And when the textile industries were going really good, say from 2001 through 2008, they were shipping a lot of their cotton to China to be processed, you know, in the factories. But since, you know, the land degradation is increasing, they have less land now and they actually have less capability of supporting large crops and at the same time having the huge influx of populations moving into Ulaanbaatar and the other regional cities that they have in the area. So, you know, that's just one case. And then if you look at Russia, you know, with the Aral Sea, they did a huge 
um, you know, planned economy with, you know, same thing with uh, the cash crop with cotton, but then they suck out 90% of the water, so the Aral Sea is only 10% of what it was, which was like at, at the time like the fifth or sixth largest water, freshwater body in the world, and now it's just gone. So these are two interesting case studies of what's going on right now. That's a very good question, and that's really happening in the Mongolia areas, that's a similar situation in the Xinjiang areas. Okay. Now over Greece, and now the Chinese government would you try to want, want them to to live in one area, not to move around, and they could invest lots of money to so, to help the local farmers. And another thing is for the Mongolians, actually they are pretty rich right now because of the coal mining in that area. That's why lots of people that don't work on the the grassland, the flood flood to the, the city to enjoy their life with the money from the government or from the oil from the, the coal mining companies. So thank you very much. Thank you.